In Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, we encounter the reality that the gospel story has the power to transform every single aspect of our story. And that's exactly what we were made for. This is Ephesians in Word Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia. And you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. When I die, right, if I was to die in the next, I think we're at about 14 and a half, 15 years left. Uh, my family will be fine financially, but that's because of something called term life insurance, right? 20 years term life insurance. It's not because I have an inheritance for my family, not a massive one. I don't. Um, and so after that timeline, right, like when the term life expires, there's not a whole lot left behind for my family. Um, there certainly will be something, but not, not a lot. But for the Christian, that's not true, as far as inheritance is concerned. And that's what we're going to look at today. And we just sang with confidence, and you guys sounded great singing that song, It Is Well With My Soul. Well, how can we say that when all around us the world looks like it does and, and so many things maybe feel hopeless in life? Well, it's because we have hope, a rich and glorious hope, beyond the grave. And so what we'll see in just four verses today is that our gospel inheritance, which is secured and sealed by grace, transforms how we live today. It makes a difference in in the present, and it gives peace-filled rest as we look towards tomorrow. This is our hope. So, Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So we, we're we going to crescendo, the whole thing crescendos with verse 14, at least to the point of rejoicing in the inheritance that we have in Jesus. But the first three verses that lead into it kind of lay this groundwork of confidence that we have. They give us reasons for the confidence that we have in our inheritance. And the first one is found in verse 11. Our gospel inheritance is sovereignly ordained. It's a big concept. But you see it here in verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, big million dollar word right there, to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This verse highlights the sovereignty of God in two ways. It it has that word predestined. It has the fact that he works things according to the counsel of his will. Now it's, Bible 101, right, that God is sovereign, that He reigns supreme over all. It's everywhere in Scripture. We understand that. But there, there are some layers underneath that doctrine that can maybe get sticky or maybe get a little bit difficult to understand or wrestle with. And, and since we've seen the word predestined twice now, I, I was able to punt last week, but I can't punt this week. We gotta, Talk about it, but it's also a 25 to 30 minute sermon, so we'll be quick. We are going to read a few scriptures here real quick, kind of take a a uh, trip through some scriptures. I want you to understand what we're talking about when I mean that sovereignty of God is something worth wrestling with. We see verses like this all through scripture, Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 6, I am the Lord, there is no other, everybody on On Jesus' team goes, yes, we love that. There's no other God but Him. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you. We like that as the children of God. I equip you, though you do not know me. There's a sense there where He's moving towards us, even when we weren't necessarily moving towards Him. That people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. Amen. We love that. But then verse 7 comes, and it gets a little weird. Because verse 7 says, I form light, oh, we like that, and create darkness. Ugh. I make well-being, we like that, and create calamity. Yeah. I am the Lord who does all these things. You see, a God who is all-powerful, who reigns supreme has a measure of culpability in everything that happens. Regardless of your finer points of doctrine, right? There's there's kind of two major camps when you talk about the sovereignty of God, and nobody really fits 
specifically in these two camps, but it's like the, these polar opposite ends of Arminianism, if you've ever heard that term, and, and Calvinism, like these people who are just all about the sovereignty of God and these people who are all about the free will of man. And, and those two viewpoints just can't connect together into one and everybody kind of is dying on these hills on either side. There's a lot to wrestle with on either side of that argument. If you have an all-powerful God who can do anything and he chooses not to act, or he chooses to act either way, right? Like, like if I push my kid in front of a car, that's evil. But if I see my kid about to run in front of a car and I say, well, free will, baby, that's kind of evil too if I don't save him, right? So what, like, what's that all about? We're okay with verses like this one. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. We kind of can sit with that a little bit. But then what about verses like this one? They carry with them this complexity underneath. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. That's great when the king's a good guy. But what about when the king's a a bad guy? What about when it's Pharaoh? And God talks to Moses. He's sending him in to, to proclaim the, the plagues that are coming and, and lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and an exodus. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that, that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I, God says, will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And maybe I'm creating more questions than you had before you walked in here. And if so, I apologize. But when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, there will be countless firstborn Egyptian children who will die when the death angel passes over. Okay? Because God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Does that unsettle you a bit? Like, it's okay to be unsettled by that. That unsettles me a little bit. The supreme God of the universe, so powerful, so in control in Scripture, paints himself as this sovereign being who gets himself on the hook for some stuff that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 9, verses 16 through 18. He actually mentions another Old Testament example, Esau and Jacob. Esau was the second born, or the first born. Jacob was the second born, but yet Jacob gets the inheritance, which is unfair by the cultural standards of the day. And and in earlier verses in Romans 9, uh, Paul says of God, Jacob he loved and Esau he hated. And later he says, so it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. And he leverages these two examples for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Whew. And so, right, I may be creating more questions than answers. I get it. What I want to set you free to today is to wrestle with this idea of God's sovereignty. See, that's not the only thing the Bible teaches. The Bible also teaches that that, uh, there is a free moral agency inside every human. A free moral agency to choose and to be held responsible for our choices. That's taught in Scripture too. They're both in here. I could take you to a bunch of other verses to show you that. How do those two things come together? I don't know, right? Can I say that as the pastor? That there's ways that I can't even comprehend that. And what I'm telling you is that that's okay. How do you reckon verses like the hardening of Pharaoh's heart that leads to the death of firstborn children, how do you connect that to God's love? It's okay to wrestle with that. I'm not going to write. You could read volumes on this issue. Volumes. I'd love to have. I can have discussions outside of this too and answer your extra questions. But for the sake of time, I want us to have four takeaways that I think are even more important. One, it's okay to wrestle with this. Because it really is. It's okay to wrestle with these issues. You're not some doubter or some terrible Christian because you're like trying to figure out how the absolute sovereignty of God 
coincides with the free moral agency of humanity. <laughs> People have been wrestling with that for thousands of years. That's fine. Number two, some answers don't come this side of heaven. Like, there's some things that you won't quite wrap your mind around about Christianity until you are with God in, in heaven. Spurgeon, this is a long quote, but he puts it this way, and it's exactly about this issue, about the sovereignty of God and the, and the free will of man. He says, God predestines and that man is responsible are two things that few can see, right, as, as existing in the same time. They are believed to be inconsistent and contradictory, but they are not. And it is just the fault of our weak judgment. Two truths cannot be contradictory to each other. If God says they're both true, then they both have to be true. If then I find taught in one place that everything is foreordained, that God is sovereign, and all, then this is true. And if I find in another place that man is responsible for all his actions, then that is also true. And it is my folly that leads me to imagine that those two truths are a contradiction to each other. These uh, two truths I do not believe can ever be welded into one upon a human anvil. Our brains can't put them together, dovetail them together, but one they shall be in eternity. I love this analogy. They are two lines that are so nearly parallel that the mind that shall pursue them farthest will never discover that they converge, but they do converge, and they will meet somewhere in eternity close to the throne of God whence all truth doth spring. You have a human mind that can't fathom the, the free will of man alongside the absolute sovereignty of God. I'm the same. And that's okay. But one day we'll see it. One day we'll understand it clearly. More importantly, takeaway number three, be humble, right? So if you find yourself having this really deep conviction about the sovereignty of God or this really deep conviction about the free will of man, be humble. For thousands of years, Christians have wrestled with these issues. You ain't the one that's figured it out, okay? No offense, but you haven't. Be humble. And then lastly, and this is by far the most important one, whatever God is doing with the doctrine of election, with the doctrine of the free moral agency of humanity, whatever God is doing with predestination, whatever God is doing with his sovereignty, it is in love. We saw this last week, in love. He predestined us for adoption. Every action that God is taking in this world is rooted in love that we can't comprehend. And so, as you understand the free moral agency of humanity and you understand the sovereignty of God, if you come to a place where that doesn't feel loving to you, then I would challenge myself. Maybe my view of sovereignty is wrong. Maybe my view of free moral agency is wrong. Or maybe my understanding of love is wrong. God gets to set the terms for all of it. He gets to define what love is. He gets to define what sovereignty is. He gets to define what free moral agency is. So those things can coexist. It's okay to wrestle with them. Some of our answers won't come until the other side of, of heaven. So we can be humble. Most importantly, we can trust God's love. And know this today. Regardless of where you land on these issues, it is orthodox. It is orthodox to believe that all the power of God is at work in saving his children. All the power of God is at work in seeing his children through to the end. All the power of God is at work in securing your inheritance. The next two go faster, but the first is that our gospel inheritance is sovereignly ordained. There's a lot more to be said about that first one, but we only have a few minutes. Second, our gospel inheritance is for God's glory. So what, uh, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. There's some other things in the first half of that verse that we don't have time to, to get into, unfortunately. But the ultimate goal of God's saving of you, God's keeping of you, and God giving you an inheritance that He's promised to you is for His glory. Glory. Now, it might sound like these first two verses are just all about, about God, about his sovereignty, about his desires, about his glory, about his purposes. And, and the reason they sound that way is because they are. That's what they're about. They're about God's sovereignty and salvation and, and, and your inheritance. They're about God's glory and your salvation and your inheritance. But those are good news. They're good news because God is for God. There's a verse in the Old Testament where God says, I will not give my glory to another. I will not give my glory. God is for his own 
glory. Now, for me to do that, it'd be narcissist. If I came up here and said, look to me, right, for your joy, look to me for your happiness, honor me, that would be evil, right? That would be unrighteous. That would be unkind. That would be unloving because you will find nothing in me. But God is the only being in the universe that can stand up and say, look to me, worship me, love me, find all of your worth and value in me. And when he does it, he's actually righteous. When he does it, he's actually good. He's actually kind. He's actually loving. So God says, find me to be everything you need. And that is for God's Glory. So when God seeks his own glory, he's doing what's right. And if your inheritance, which we're going to look at what it is here in just a second, if your inheritance brings glory to God, that's just another reason you can rest secure in it happening. Because God will get his glory. And if your good brings God glory and your inheritance brings God glory, then you can bank on it. You're going to get that inheritance. Verse 13 shows us the one last place of confidence. And that's that our gospel inheritance is sealed by the the Holy Spirit. It starts with the word of God, though. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. This is a an idea that we see more explicitly in Romans 10 that says this. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That the word of God is what God uses to open our eyes to the truth of the gospel. Pretty basic, but that's why it's important. That the word of God is proclaimed when we're sharing the gospel with other people. That the word of God is proclaimed when we're singing songs, when we're celebrating communion, when we're preaching, when we're in this life, as we go through this life. But what happens after, right? So the eyes are open through the scripture. There's faith to believe the gospel given to them. Then what happens is you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of your inheritance. The Holy Spirit is the seal and the guarantee. Now, these are two word pictures in uh, the days of Ephesus. The first would have been for a brand, a seal being a brand, right? Like any cattlemen in here, right? Like you brand your cattle or, or your animals, right, with, with some sort of logo or sign that says this belongs to me. The Holy Spirit is our brand. We're branded, right? The fact that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us means we're branded. I belong to God. The Holy Spirit reveals that. The guarantee is like a down payment, uh, like a pledge. The fact that we have the Holy Spirit at work in us is the evidence that God will keep all of his promises to us. And so as you think through uh, your life, that evidence in your life that maybe shows up that you're walking in step with the Holy Spirit, those times that you maybe refrain from anger, or those times that you move to someone in kindness, that time you times you display generosity. Those are all evidences of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And the fact that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life is just a, a sign that you are sealed for your inheritance, which brings us to the crescendo, our inheritance. Verse 14, the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the day we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The evidence of verse 14 is this. We talked about it last week. Our inheritance is a little bit already and a little bit not yet. But every part of it is guaranteed. What I mean is there's parts of your inheritance that you're experiencing already now. Imagine a child of like a rich person. When they gain their inheritance, right, there will be parts of their inheritance, maybe a home that they've already utilized, right? But there might also be that Corvette in the garage that's been covered up with a tarp and brought out once a year by dad that they've never got to experience, right? But in their inheritance now, they get to experience it fully. That's the way our inheritance is in Christ. There are parts we've already begun to experience. We looked at them last week. We are blessed and chosen and graced and beloved and redeemed and forgiven. We are positionally holy and blameless. We are the adopted children of God. We are bringing glory to God, not perfectly, but in part. We're enlightened, not perfectly enlightened, but we've begun to become enlightened to the truth of the gospel. And on and on the list could go. Your inheritance is graciously generous. There's other parts that are not yet, though. One day you'll be completely perfect. 
before God. He will make you 100% righteous, actually righteous. One day you will be perfectly enlightened. You will know all the truth. You'll have eternal life with God. These are in our future. See how graciously generous our gospel inheritance is? Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. I want to crank it to 11 as we close, though, right? I want to really reckon our inheritance. One day you will be with Jesus. That's part of your inheritance. And one day you will be like Jesus. That's part of your inheritance. We get that. We've seen that. But there's another piece. One day you will be a co-owner with Jesus of all that is God. This is the reality, and it might sound like a fairy tale, but it's it's biblical. Matthew 5, 5 isn't a lie. The blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Serious. It's going to be yours, all of it, right? He says, uh, Paul says in Romans, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through righteousness of faith. All those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ through faith are saved. And for them, they're heirs to the world. So let no one boast in men, for all things, children of God, are yours. All of them are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are are God, you are Christ, and Christ is God's. It's hard to wrap your mind around this. But Saturn is yours. I'm serious. Like, all the gold in Alcatraz, Alcatraz, Fort Knox, there's gold in Alcatraz too, by the way. That's a new theory I've been working on. It's yours. It's promised to you. All of the earth, all of the universe is yours. God's going to remake it perfectly, and then you're going to co-own it with Him. This changes everything, if we really believe that. You see, the confidence that we have rooted in our inheritance is can be massive. Because you can either live for it all today, all the things that the world has to offer and lose it tomorrow, or you can yoke up with Jesus no matter the cost and gain it all for eternity. That's what's before us. If what God says about our inheritance is true, then we can be like Jim Elliott. Probably quote this 50 times before my ministry career is over. Jim Elliott said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And then he went into the Amazon jungle to tell a tribe of people who had never heard the name of Jesus the truth of the gospel, and they killed him. He knew that risk before he went. And yet he went. And again, God's going to call us all to different things that are different measures of of risk or different measures of discomfort in our inheritance is something we cannot lose. And therefore, we can give away all the things we cannot keep because we know we will gain something, an inheritance in Christ that we cannot lose. Child of God, your inheritance is real. And it's secured. And it is beyond your wildest dreams. And if you're not a Christian, you can get in on it. To all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, you'll be part of the family. If you have questions about what that looks like, I'd love to answer them, but but then you can become an heir. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today and be saved. And If you're already a Christian, two questions as we close. Two questions I want you to ask yourself, and, and if you have somebody in your life who you trust this week, you can ask them to speak into this too. It's just the opposite side of the same question, really. One... What are the evidences in your life that you still have doubts about the reality of your inheritance? Like what things in your life show, hey, I still got some doubts about my inheritance. There's there's things that I'm still clinging to. There's things that I'm still afraid of. There's still things that I'm holding back on. 
There's, there's things in my life that I'm refusing to change. What are the evidences in your life that you're not fully buying it when it comes to the reality of your inheritance? And then on the flip side, question two, what are the evidences in your life that are appearing that you do believe the reality of your inheritance? What are you giving away? What risk are you taking? Where, where are you being bold? Where have you given more than you thought you could? Where have you bled out for others and loved sacrificially? I can answer that second question for a lot of you because I've seen it. I've seen it manifested in, on the core team of this, of this church plant and of those who attend. I've seen you guys loving sacrificially. I've seen these guys giving your life away showing that you do believe in this reality of this inheritance. The truth of the matter is, though, there's going to be uh, stuff to an- there's going to be answers to both questions because doubt is part of the fact that we haven't been made perfect yet. So remember this. When you doubt, if we are faith- faithless, God remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So God, the one who secures your inheritance, secures your inheritance even when you doubt. And the God who's working out those current evidences of of grace where you write that list out, these are signs that I do believe in my inheritance. This is evidence that I do believe in the air. The God who's already made that happen is the God who will, in the other areas, where you're still struggling to believe, where you're still struggling to obey, where you're still struggling to walk in the reality of your inheritance. He's the same God who will help you with that. Giving you more faith than you have today. Giving you more uh, trust, more obedience than you have today so that we as the people of God can move onward along obedience in the same direction. Sovereignly empowered and for God's glory, sealed and strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Yoked up with our gentle and lowly Savior, Jesus with his light burden and his easy load. The weary find rest. The anxious find peace. And part of that peace and part of that rest is knowing that our inheritance, the promises of God, and all that is his belongs to us and is secured for us in Christ. Our gospel inheritance Secured and sealed by grace transforms how we live today. Might it transform how we live today and it gives peace-filled rest as we look towards tomorrow. Father, this is a reality I can't do justice to. If I'm honest, I doubt it too. Not all the time, not like completely, but I still wrestle with doubt. There's still evidence that I'll be able to make a list too of evidence in my life that I'm still struggling to believe the reality of my inheritance. There's things I'm striving for in this life that aren't going to give me lasting peace and joy. There's things that I'm striving for and and seeking that aren't evidence that I believe that you will bestow upon me spiritually, physically, emotionally, all that is needed for life and godliness and joy and satisfaction. So I repent of that. Might we be repentful? But there's also evidence in my life and in the lives of the people in this room that you are transforming us into people who believe in this reality. Might that become more and more common amongst us? We are resting in the reality of our future inheritance and your future promise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this feed wherever you listen to podcasts. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. And we'd love for you to experience what God is doing as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. Connect with us online at www.mercyvillage.church.